The first presentation is actually by two speakers. Uh, now, the first of these is William Jordan or Bill Jordan. Um, Bill is in Wisconsin, USA, and uh, the second presenter, David Curtis, is live here in the auditorium. Now, Bill's uh, recorded a uh, presentation, but he's also here live, virtually, I mean. He's um, in real time attending this session virtually, and he, we hope to have a little bit of time to um, ask him a question. We're very fortunate to have some of, uh, someone of his stature open this session because um, many of you know, may know him as a, a senior historian and philosopher of restoration. He's been a leading light in this area for around four decades. In, uh, in the 1980s, he started the very first journal for restorationists so that practitioners could share their discoveries. And he went on to provide a theoretical context for restoration as a means of ecological inquiry, but also very importantly, as a way of rebuilding humanity's relationship with the rest of nature. Now, he sees a role for art, particularly performance, and a role for ritual in restoration to reinforce uh, the renewal process that restoration really is. So uh, if you could play um, Bill's presentation now, that would be great, Michael, thank you. It's great to be here from halfway around the world. Um, uh, Bill Jordan in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, here, here, here with you all virtually uh, to share some thoughts about uh, the business and implications of ecological restoration. Um, I've been uh, spent 24 years working at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum, uh, whose uh, historic uh, contributions or historic contributions to uh, ecological restoration dating back to the 1930s kind of led me as sort of the interpreter of the Arboretum to uh, wind up thinking about that back in the 70s and 80s at a time when actually restoration wasn't much of an item in environmental circles, which focused mostly on, um, and environmental thinking, which focused mostly on uh, preservation of so-called natural uh, ecosystems. And uh, restoration when restored ecosystems were regarded somewhat apologetically as kind of fake and of course imperfect. Um, kind of overlooking the fact that in the long run, uh, what we have left of the historic ecosystems will be the result of varying degrees of ecological restoration carried out to compensate for novel influences, which are unavoidable. Anyway, um, working with my colleague Keith Went there over the years, um, we, we, we gave a lot of thought to just, okay, if we think this is important, what's so great about it? What, what good is it? And we thought about uh, its value for the, for the ecosystem is fairly obvious. Um, you go to a cornfield and restore a prairie and you've got a prairie back. So there's something to be said for that. It may be imperfect, but it's better than a cornfield from the point of view of you know, a historic um, ecological system. Um, we explored the idea that it's valuable for, for eco e ecology as a technique for basic research, for testing ideas about how ecosystems work. The, the simple, obvious idea that if you want to test an idea about something, say a, a car or a violin, uh, try, to, try to build one. That's the kind of ultimate test of your understanding. Also it had obvious value as an experience, bringing in the human experiences of nature, beginning with hunting and gathering as in seed collecting, for example. Um, agriculture, because it is really a form of gardening, agriculture, and science. That's what we called restoration ecology. But finally, came to, I came to this last uh, um, performance. Restoration is a performing art. Um, and gradually, uh, I encountered readings that led me to believe that this is uh, ancient wisdom, the importance of performance in negotiating the relationship with nature is ancient wisdom and um, something that uh, modern societies are not particularly good at. And um, 
uh, rituals of what uh, anthropologists have called world renewal, for example, the sun dance of the uh, Plains Indians in the United States, um, or the Ntichi Wuma of Central Australian groups, um, described as an increase ceremony to maintain populations of important key species, important to the um, to the people and their and their economy, for that matter. The point is that conservation depends on humans, and so on their behavior, and so on their values, the values that underlie that behavior, and so on the technologies of value creation. How do you, how do people create values, conscience, form consciences? How do they transmit them to their children and so forth? Well, um, it turns out that a key element, a key technology, so to speak, in value creation and management is performance and the arts, which anthropologist Victor Turner called the uh, daughters of ritual. Ritual being part of the, the line in um, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, the Titania, the queen of the fairies, is um, complaining to her estranged husband because he's interfering with what she calls our sport, by which she means the rituals that the fairies perform in order to maintain the order of nature. And she says, and with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Therefore the winds piping to us in vain have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, which falling in the land have every little river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox has therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn hath rotted ere his youth attained a beard. And she goes on as a gorgeous tirade, act two, scene one, if you want to look it up. Um, and through all this distemperature, we see the seasons alter. Hoary headed frost, this is climate change, guys. Hoary headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old winter's thin and icy brow, an odorous chaplet of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. And so forth. Um, it really is a gorgeous tirade. You gotta, you gotta look it up. But um, what do we make of this? I think it expresses ancient wisdom. Leopold urged, urged us to change our values suggested that the key log holding up conservation was just basically our values. And he suggests that we change them. But how do we change them? And here's where I suggest, and it's not my idea, it's rather widely recognized, I think, that the way we do that most fundamentally is through performance and the daughters of performance, um, the, the various arts. Um, so they engage us emotionally. You don't, you don't usually change people's values by arguing with them. Sometimes maybe you do, sometimes maybe it helps. Um, but how often does that happen? Recent thinking is that emotion is the foundation of thinking and we have to get at emotions in order to change thinking and therefore behavior. So literal restoration isn't enough. Like other mundane activities, like hunting, gathering, eating, it can be made into a performance. And so we, we've given some thought, and I urge you to give some thought to ritualizing or turning into performance elements of the restoration project you're involved in. And it can start with a, what I think is a, a lovely example of this from uh, carried out by colleagues of mine down in Northern Illinois um, uh, at the uh, McHenry County Illinois Conservation District with the, the development of restoration as a performing art with the spectacular, and all you have to do is go on from there. So their first step was to do a burns, to do burns at night, which enhanced the spectacle. And I think, um, I think the team is in a position to show us a, a short uh, video of one of their night burns. So thanks very much. And um, perhaps we can talk about some of these ideas. Thank you, Bill, if you're listening, we really appreciated that. I looked around the room and saw lots of engaged faces. So um, thank you. Now, uh, Michael may or may not be able to play that video. Uh, it's of um, conservation burns. 
Yes. Fantastic. Brad Woodson, I'm a restoration ecologist with the McHenry County Conservation District. And uh, yeah, tonight we're doing a night burn at Glacial Park in Ringwood, Illinois. And we're gonna burn about 20 acres and do a ring uh, perimeter technique, start on the downwind side and slowly bring the, the burn uh, upwind and we'll have a head fire. And I guess one of the difficulties we're dealing with is we're burning down a slope and typically the fire burns much better up a slope. So, um, but we have a nice wind, so it should be a decent burn for us tonight. We thought it'd be a neat night program to see the, you know, the fire silhouetted against the background, the, the black sky. And uh, we did one last year and it worked out pretty good. We had a nice turnout and we thought we'd do it again. Uh, and the, and the, the, the public who comes to it, we kind of show them, we want to show them how to do a burn, but also show them how neat uh, some of the burns can be also. We, we, uh, we actually, the district we've been burning for about the last uh, 30 years, and it's a, it's a common principle or common practice in ecological restoration. And what it does is we're actually trying to control brush that's growing in the prairies. And uh, it also, the seeds uh, and, and plants are adapted to that. So they germinate and they grow much better than native plants. So it's a, it's a management tool we use to manage prairies and woodlands. Yeah, we, typically we'd love to burn uh, some of our areas every two to three years, but we, the district's at about 23,000 acres now. So a lot of times we're only getting into areas every three to four years. And that's just enough uh, burn rotation to keep some of the brush under control. Yeah, I'm glad we had a good turnout and we see a lot more burning going on throughout the county uh, more and more. And um, yeah, hopefully people are managing the prairies and, and their habitat. So it's a good thing. Thank you, that was great. Is there anybody who'd like to ask one quick question to Bill? Uh, we haven't really got a lot of time in the session. If not, we can save it till later, Bill. Now I'm going to introduce uh, David Curtis. Did I not wait long enough then? <laughs> no, no hands were going up. David is honorary fellow at University of Wollongong. And like Bill has over he has over 40 years experience in ecological restoration, having worked for many years as a regional manager for Greening Australia in New South Wales. Deeply interested in the arts, for the last 20 years, David has been researching and writing about the role of the arts in stimulating pro-environmental behaviour. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks very much, Jean, and. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here and um, pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, so I thought just following on from Bill, Bill's talk, I'd provide a kind of overall framework with which we can view the, the way the arts can influence people's ideas and actions towards the environment or towards ecological restoration in particular. I think it's kind of helpful to see the arts as acting through one of three pathways to um, influence people or bring people to ecological restoration. The first is through building empathy for nature and for ecological nature. The second is by providing a cognitive interest in, in nature and restoration. And the third is where the arts are built into the restoration project process itself. And I'll provide just a few examples of some of those in my talk, and there'll be more later uh, this afternoon. Uh, Pro-environmental behaviour like uh, um, ecological restoration can be predicted by a person's uh, emotional affinity towards uh, nature or their cognitive interest in nature, so how much do they know about nature? Or it can be predicted by a person having a certain level of indignation about land degradation. And all these things come about from our present and past experiences with the natural environment. But artists also directly experience nature and land degradation and produce their art. And what I'd like to try and show to this afternoon is how their art can influence each of these three things, emotional affinity, cognitive interest in nature and indignation about degradation. So the first pathway, um, how the arts can build empathy towards the natural environment some years ago, I, I, researched, I interviewed about 100 people, some working in the arts, performing arts and visual arts, some working in natural resource management extension, and others who were people who directly um, worked with the environment, such as farmers who were adopting conservation practices on their properties. And I came up with this idea of chains of inspiration where, simply put, nature inspired art, artists to create art, which in, in turn inspired 
the extensionists, which have in turn inspired the people who worked on the environment. Of course, this simple linear progression, one direction is, can go back the other way as well. The arrows can, can go either way. Um, but I did find it quite a useful um, way of uh, thinking. And for example, I interviewed John and Cecily Fenton, who were farmers in South, Southwest Victoria, who have adopted, who are real pioneers in conservation practices on their farm. They were very influenced by a researcher, Rod Bird, a farm forestry researcher. And when I interviewed Rod, he said he could cite different artists such as John Olson and Neil Douglas and Michael Dunick, who had inspired him or who reflected his attitude towards the environment. When you went to those artists, you'd find that they, they would say, well, they're inspired by, by nature for, for the art that they create. So these were all my little chains of inspiration that I interviewed the different people from those different categories. Looks like a great big organism um, of inspiration going from one way to the other. Um, now, all of us would have pictures in our houses, I'm sure, that affirm our belief in nature and our love of nature. But I particularly wanted to home in on two particular types of art that create empathy for nature, where the art itself is in the natural environment and is incorporated into restorative practices. Leanne Thompson works with a farmer in central west New South Wales who's very involved in restorative agriculture. And uh, she creates these amazing sculptures, woven sculptures, which she puts in, in situ into the restorative restoration areas. As well as working by herself, she also runs big workshops where lots of people participate in creating those sculptures. Another example is um, an ephemeral art project that EcoArts Australis initiated where ephemeral art was put in, into a um, restoration site in Armidale, New South Wales, uh, as part of a big community event. And the various, we had four artists working on this and they created these beautiful um, ephemeral artworks. Some, such as Andrew Parker's sculptures were uh, had seeds impregnated in them and as the pots gradually melted away, the seeds germinated and contributed to the restoration of the, of the site. So going to the second pathway where, where um, the arts are used in educative, uh, er, educative function, the Tree Veneration Society provides quite a nice example of this. They're based in Sydney and often run sort of ecological workshops or teaching workshops for children and members of the community. And they use a lot of art as part of their, their teaching practice. And it's a really nice way of bringing, bringing scientific information to life. Another example where art has been used to actually inform restoration is the, uh, the Tower Hill Reserve area in Warrnambool, Victoria. This was heavily cleared post European colonization and when um, when people wanted to restore that site, they went back to a painting that was done by Eugene von Gerard in the 1850s. And his, his um, re rendition of that ecosystem was so accurate that re ecological restorers could use that to inform what they were doing with their restorative processes. Another example is where art is used to articulate different landscape scenarios. So this was a, a set of four pictures that I commissioned some years ago from a, an artist, Marie Kelly, in the Liverpool Plains part area of New South Wales. And the different lands, the different paintings were, the idea was that they articulated different views of that landscape under different scenarios. So the, the first view was what was considered to look like pre-European uh, agriculture coming into that area. The second picture is how it looks now. The third picture was how it might become if degradation was to become worse. And the, the fourth is uh, a view of the landscape in the future of where we might go with our restoration. And, and also this other one was with Jill Sampson who coordinated a massive project with about 400 artists uh, to, bring, to evoke indignation about the clearing of the Bimble Box Nature Reserve in central Queensland that was being cleared for coal mines and 150 odd birds species live in that area. So the final pathway is where uh, the arts are incorporated into the ecological process, restoration process itself. I think there's an interesting overlap where ecological art and ecological restoration sort of overlap to create an ecological aesthetic. And um, 
for example, with ecological art, this, this art, ecological artwork by Catherine von Wilkenberg in west of Melbourne, she worked at a grassland situation there where they were restoring the grasslands and created this massive um, artwork out of the plants that they were using to restore that ecosystem. Uh, Sue Stevens is with Waverley Council and does pretty traditional sort of ecos ecosystem restoration, but she brings to mind, to brings in very strong ecological, very strong aesthetical and des landscape design principles in the choice of plants and how she plants them. Um, and, you know, as Bill was saying, uh, performance and uh, celebration can be built into restoration and these sorts of celebrationist events can be really great at celebrating the work that takes place, such as the Black Gully Music Festival in Armidale that thousands of people now experience as they come to the, the Black Gully area that's been restored and experience great, great musical performances. That's been going for some years now. And getting back to where Bill was talking about was with Ritual, the Tree Veneration Society very, has been very strongly influenced by in, the Indian um, uh, veneration of trees and they've brought those ideas into to various events in Sydney. So that's where I thought I'd leave it, just to, so, so providing that kind of framework with the three pathways through which the arts can act, uh, building empathy, cognitive interest and being built into the restoration. So if you think of it as being the heart, the hands, the heart, the head and the hands of, of restoration. Thank you.